Uh, here I have a cylinder, and uh, this cylinder, I'd very much like to know what is the uh, volume of the cylinder. In order to do that, I need to know what is the equation for the volume of a cylinder. Does anybody know? Because I actually know. Volume of a cylinder, come on. That's right, it's pi r squared times h, where r is the radius of the cylinder and h is the height of the cylinder. And that doesn't surprise me because re regular volumes like this, you take the cross-sectional area and multiply by the length and that's going to be the volume of the thing. So the volume is pi r squared h. So if I wanted to know, <clears throat> if I wanted to know the volume of this thing, I would have to make two measurements. I would have to measure the radius uh, and I would have to measure the height. So let me give you a number for the radius. I'm just making this up. <clears throat> the radius of the thing, uh, I'm going to make 56.31 plus or minus 0 0.05 uh, centimeter. I absolutely just made that up off the top of my head, but I must make sure that the precision matches, a fictional number, but the precision has to match. Do you see I have hundredths place and I have hundredths place, and that must always be the case in the, in the, in the values that I'm supplied and also in my answers. So that's the radius that I measure, and then I measure the height. Uh, and I'm going to make the height, I'm going to be a little silly with this, I'm going to make the height 130 plus or minus 10. So I have a really good number. I measured the radius really, really well, and I did a terrible job of measuring the height, just to show how these things play out and affect the uncertainty of the results. So I don't have my list of steps <clears throat> written down, but hopefully you have them in, the, in your notes. If you want to refer to them, I have them in my head. I know that the very first thing that I do is pretend as though uncertainty does not matter at all, as if I never learned about it and I just do it. I just calculate the thing, pi r squared times h. And I wonder if someone has done that calculation for me in anticipation and can give me the answer with some units. With some, not some units. Got me thinking about units now. With some digits. Ha ha ha. Um, what? Sorry. Ugh, that's crazy. Yes. Well, it wouldn't... Oh, it would have to be... Well, the uncertainty could in fact be 10, uh, depending on the measuring instrument that I use. But if it was 130 with a decimal point on there, it could be 11, it could be 12, because it would match precision in that, in that significant digit. But it depends on the measuring. No. So now I just did it. Next thing for me to do is to calculate the relative uncertainties. What is the relative uncertainty in this measurement, Hana? 0.078? Well, yeah, Hana, I don't disagree with you, because in order to give me the percentage that I asked for, you would multiply by 100. And hang on, Hana, Hana, Hana. And then later on, you're just going to divide by 100 again anyway. So Hana's argument would be, why am I going to multiply by 100 and then divide by 100 later? It seems like a waste of time. So what is the percentage? It is 7.869. No? No. All I'm asking for is the relative uncertainty of this number. And if we, honestly though, if we don't give me what I'm asking for, it's apt to confuse some of our friends who are following along. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. 0.088%. Okay. And that doesn't surprise me that it's a low percentage because it's a very, very precise number. It's a good, uh, a very precise measurement. It's a good measurement. Over here, uh, what's the percent uncertainty in this? 10 divided by 130 times 100. 7.6923. 7.6923. That's more digits than I would ever keep for that. So I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to call it 7.69. I'm plenty of digits. 7 look prettier. There you go. 7.69%. <clears throat> Out of these two measurements, that relative uncertainty shows me that the height measurement is the worst. If I wanted to improve this experiment, and determining the volume of a thing isn't really an experiment, but if I wanted to improve this experiment, that's where I would go to improve it. Now, the next thing that I do is I apply the rule. And the rule of uncertainty says that whenever I multiply or divide numbers that have uncertainties, the relative uncertainty of the result is the sum of the relative uncertainties. The relative uncertainty of the result is the sum of the relative uncertainties. Well, in order to calculate this, I have to do r times r times h. And so this is going to be 0 0.0888 plus 0 0.0888 plus 7.69. It's very critical that I realize that I'm adding the relative uncertainty of the radius twice because it's squared. And squaring is multiplying times itself. And pi is a constant which we assume to be infinitely precise, and so it doesn't come into this calculation at all. What is this equal to when I add all this up? Percent. That is the relative uncertainty of this gigantic number. This gigantic number is kind of irritating me a little bit. It's got way, way more digits than I need, but I'm not going to jump a step. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to round it right here for my own uh, porpoises as 1, 2, 9, 4, 9, 8, 3, and leave those decimal. 
I have the relative uncertainty in the form of a percent, but that's not what I want. I want the absolute uncertainty. So what I need to ask you to calculate for me is, what is 7.8676% of 1,294,938? Anna, 10191. So 101,913.86 is reportedly 7.8676% of 1,294,908. Nah, but I'm not done. Because I know that I can't have this ridiculous number of significant figures in my answer. In fact, I recall that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link and a calculation is only as strong as its weakest number. <clears throat> uh, the radius here has four significant digits. No matter what, it has more significant digits than H. But when I look at H, I have to determine how many significant digits does that have? Well, notice that my uncertainty is rounded to the tens place, which means that three is significant, but the zero is not. And Sophia caught me on that right, about, right off the bat. She knew that I was up to some of that, about figuring out the number of significant digits that I have based on the uncertainty. If the uncertainty actually said 11, something like that, then that ones place was significant and that would be three significant. So there's a little bit of interpretation. I know you'd probably like the rules of significant digits to be a bit more rigid. Unfortunately, they're not. A lot of how I interpret significant digits depends on context and some of it even depends on how I make my measurement. So there's often more to the story than simply looking at the number. At any rate, <clears throat> that's two significant digits. So my answer can only have two. So this is colossal. This turns out to be 1,300,000. And that's horrifying because I just ditched a ton of digits. They didn't mean anything. There was no physical meaning at all. Makes the number look better because there's lots of stuff going on, but it's not real. It's not a real part of the measurement. And then I'll tack this on the end. If you don't mind, I'll do both these steps at once. <clears throat> Please remember, you are never, ever, ever adjusting the number of significant digits of the uncertainty. For the uncertainty, it is not an issue of significant digits. Ever. There's no occasion when it is. What I want to do with the uncertainty is make sure the precision matches, like I did here. Hundredths place, hundredths place, tens place, tens place. I'm going to match the precision of the number. Well, this is the, the hundred thousands place, the hundred thousands place. So I have to round the uncertainty, the hundred thousands place, which rounds it to 100,000. And obviously, this would be centimeters. So it's uh, 1,300,000 plus or minus 100,000. That is an honest answer to a fictitious question. You know, at some point, hi. Uh. It's this relative uncertainty divided by 100 multiplied by that gives you that number. And then I rounded it to match the precision. 100 thousands place, 100 thousands. But anyway, so I make up a bunch of examples. You've got examples in your homework, and they're all fictitious. They're all fictitious. What we're going to do now is actually quite fun. If I can ever get around to it. Hi, Casey. Your name is Casey, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, so, right. I can't, I can't round uncertainty to zero because that would mean that my answer is, is absolutely certain and there's no such thing. So I err on the side of caution and would round up. I'm going to try when I invent quiz questions and whatnot to not put you in that position where you have to make that judgment call, but it's a very sensible thing to do. I can't say that there's no uncertainty, so I estimate the lowest possible because I want the precisions to match. This number has two significant digits, and the least significant digit in it is this three in the 100 or in the um, hundred thousands place. So I'm rounding it to the hundred thousands place. That is the only answer that there is. Yes. But what should happen is if you're using the right measuring instrument for the thing that you're measuring, right? I write up ridiculous numbers. If I'm using an appropriate measuring instrument for the thing I'm trying to measure, that will never happen. I only get into trouble when I push these numbers way out of the, the sort of safe zone and then I get weirdness. Yeah? All right. <clears throat> I'm going to try again with my little intermediate introduction here. So all of these things are made up. I'm just making this stuff up off the top of my head. I'd really like to do it with an actual experiment. So that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to make an actual measure and apply these rules of uncertainty to the experiment so that we can critically see <clears throat> what uncertainty in measurement tells us about our experimental results and what we can say is true and not true about the experiments that we do. So I'm proposing a very, very, very simple experiment. And as we go about doing the experiment, you're going to imagine that we're doing a very bad job of it. You're right. That's deliberate. We're going to do an experiment not so carefully. That'll help our rules of uncertainty teach us something about experimentalism uh, and <clears throat> honesty with experimental results. When we did the ruler drop, uh, we let go of a ruler and dropped it under the influence of, of gravity. 
And I said that I was sort of cheating a bit, and I didn't want to show you an equation before it was time, uh, but uh, we'll be doing this soon enough. So what I did was I, I showed you an equation that said that the time that a thing falls under the influence of gravity is equal to the square root of twice the distance that it falls divided by g, where g is a number that I claimed was a uh, constant near the surface of the Earth that I referred to as the acceleration due to gravity. So g is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared, a thing that is very familiar to those who study physics, very, very familiar. But to you, new to physics, you might doubt the veracity of that and want to do an experiment to verify that that's true. So what our experiment will do today is verify a claim that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. That is, in a sense, our hypothesis. I'll flesh the hypothesis out in just a second. The way we'll do our experiment is we'll rearrange this equation algebraically to solve for g. So I'm just going to quick do some magical algebra in my head. Quite good at algebra, so it's all going to work out great for me. I simply square both sides and then solve for g. What I find is that the equation on the left is true, the equation on the right is true as well, because I've done careful <clears throat> algebraic and manipulation of it. And what it tells me, just like the example question that I just did, is that if I allow an object to fall under the influence of gravity and measure the distance that it falls, and its associated uncertainty, and measure the time it takes to fall that distance and compute this, I should get g. So really the hypothesis of my experiment is a little bit more sophisticated. It is, if I drop an object from a height and measure the distance that it falls and also measure the time it takes to fall that, fall, uh, fall that distance and calculate twice that distance divided by the time squared, the result will be 9.8 meters per second squared. That's my hypothesis. Try to keep that in mind because at the end of our uncertainty analysis, we'll come back to that hypothesis to see what our results say. So time to experiment. <clears throat> I've got some stuff that we need to bring along. Uh, I'll ask for volunteers. Does anybody want to be a volunteer using a stopwatch? Bang. One. Oh. Two. Well, the distance that it falls depends on your reaction. You either catch it early or you catch it late. There's a stopwatch. You raised your hand. <laughs> It was difficult getting volunteers. Hannah, would you do me a favor and bring uh, one of your rulers along with you so that you're be in charge of a ruler? <clears throat> I'd like to have somebody be in charge of this tennis ball. I'd like somebody to be in charge of this ruler. Excellent. So what we're going to do is we're going to perform our experiment in a place where we have the distance to drop something. So uh, why don't you all meet me in the stairway? Oh, yeah. I only need one person to bring a piece of paper. One person bring a notebook. Doesn't matter who it is. We do interlake our way into the hallway. <clears throat> yeah, actually, this stairwell is the is the preferred one because fewer people use it, so you don't have to be like cattle. Just sort of around. No, I don't want you to drop that. Why would you drop that? It's a measuring instrument. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Come on. Don't be shy. Don't fall. No, we are not dropping the stopwatches. <clears throat> this is the scene where we will make our measurement. Well, measurements, two measurements. Obviously, we've come here because there's quite a bit of distance for the tennis ball to fall to the bottom. This is going to be another one of those circumstances trying to make it happen. But uh, I'm not, it's not mean-spirited on my part. I want you to understand how difficult it is, the kind of thought you have to put. As we come to the end of the block today, I'm going to be describing to you an experiment that I did. I'm going to refer to the space and skylight. Um, I made a measurement of the acceleration degree, which I'll root at the end, and I made it very, very careful scientifically. But it involved uh, sort of building a makeshift crossbow, and I shot a spring-loaded apparatus up into the skylight, so I go up there and grapple the skylight, and a wire hanging down from it. <clears throat> and when I was done my experiment, I was able to whip the wire off the apparatus, but it was stuck in. It was designed that way, like the bottom part of the got to get back in orbit. So it just sat up there. Well, one day someone was coming through, a uh, custodian, so they look up in the skylight, so they inform the administration, administration, and then they have an administrative meeting all about being alarmed. Security is informed, and things really start to spiral out of control. Uh, and at the time, the principal secretary, a woman by the name of Betty Eibner, said, you know what? I'm just going to give Eric. So she called up to my classroom. Eric, hi. It's, um, did you put some kind of scientific apparatus up in the skylight in the science? Well, yeah, Betty, I did. It was my, uh, it was doing a thing with a pendulum thing. Oh, that's what I thought. Everybody here is all upset because... Thing. <laughs> <laughs>
But in a way, isn't all science basically just a terrorist attack, he said, immediately regretting it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to we're going to do a little only uh, no damage at all. Where is uh, my meter? Hannah, would you please lay the meter stick diagonally across the railing there in front of you? Just diagonally, yes. And the reason why I'm having you do that, Hannah, is not to measure anything. Well, don't. Yeah, give it lots on either side, so, right? The reason why I'm having you do this is so that we have a uh, nice spot to drop our tennis ball. Where's the tennis ball? Um, so. That tennis ball, what you'll do is you'll set it on top of the ruler there, just now, practice, don't drop it, set it on top of the ruler, set it there on top now. There you go. So what you're gonna do is you're just gonna, when, ta when the time comes, you're just gonna give it a little shove and it'll fall off there. And it'll fall from there to the, we will use its motion to determine the acceleration due to gravity in the stairwell to check, as it really is in per second squared, the way Shively. In order to do that, I'm gonna have to make two measurements. I'm going to have to measure the distance that it falls with the distance on the top of that ruler there to the floor. He set, look at Luke's already stepping up. <laughs> One interesting thing that happens here is that we see, even when we use the right measuring instrument, making measurements. Is anybody going to intervene here? Or? Is anybody going to help him? We're all the spectators here. Lucas, why not pull a little extra slack? Yeah, yeah just go ahead and go pull a little. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Absolute, absolute quiet. Absolute quiet. Absolute quiet! Oh, there you go. It's not time. About 513. So you're saying 513. 500. Well, Lucas is giving a shot at plus or my question. Is this a uh, dog and pony show? He really meant. What should we. 10, I think, is too much. Five? Five? If you say plus or minus five, honest to God, I need to be able to teach the class. If we say plus or minus one, we're clearly B. But if we say plus or minus five, we're erring on the side of caution. Very honest. Very honest. So who has, who brought a note? Who brought the paper? Ah, excellent. Would you please write down that the measurement of the height is 5.1 what? Three? 5.1 plus or minus point zero. That is a very, very honest of the height. Excellent. Meters. Yeah. Well, and the reason why I wanted it is because my acceleration due to gravity is per second squared, so I don't use meters. So it's a very prudent thing. Um, could you try to wind that up without... First of all, look at it as you wind it would be a big step. Uh, and wind it up. Let go of it. Let go of it up this. Let go of it. Let, oh, my word. Everybody needs to take a deep breath. And I cannot be the only one. Try to wrap that up without destroying it, if you could, please. Now we come to the fun part of dropping the tennis ball. Once again, I leave the technique of timing to you. Sophia is going to record the measurement. There's going to be a systematic error. So we're going to record many trials and average. How many trials do you have? Four stops. <laughs> 40 times? No, I, I don't want to do this that long, man. How about, how about 12 total? And we drop it three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, folks with stopwatches and whatnot, we need to figure out how it is that we're going to do this. So three, two, and one, or three, two, one, or three, two, one. Is it three, two, one, go? So I'm moving one? I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Oh, I'll stay down here. I'll stay down here. Okay, um, just one quick instruction. Once you're injured, move to the side so that the next cop child can get injured, okay? Hmm? Yes, you child.
I got one. I got one point oh seven. We got a reach. Yeah. I got one point zero seven. Sophia, how many measurements do you have at this point? Twelve is what we wanted. So now we can return to Clinton. Hmm? Yes. What? Hmm? Why? Why do you ask? Well, because a lot. Two point one six. Let's count that out in Mississippi, shall we? I think if the tennis ball were falling through syrup, it might make two seconds. So that piece of data is clearly an outlier. Let's let's strike it from the average. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> So, now we have exactly what I was hoping for. We have real uh, data associated with a real experiment, but what we don't have is a marker anymore. Oh, thank you. How come that worked so easily right there in the tennis ball? <laughs> All right. So, uh, Sophia, if you would please, can you calculate the average of those numbers really quickly for me? And let's strike the outlier. So, yeah, that's done with those. That's ridiculous. <clears throat> So uh, for the height, I, I recall this number uh, from being in the stairwell just now. We measured the height to be 5.13 plus or minus 0 0.05 meters. And we did that <clears throat> We did that using a measuring instrument that had better precision. But we acknowledged the fact that the measuring technique itself was flawed. So we erred on the side of ca uh, caution. What that means is the conclusions that I draw from this calculation will be correct because I have appropriately evaluated the uncertainty and erred on the side of caution. Uh, the time was measured using stopwatches, and what did you get for the time? 1.009. Now, i getting ahead of myself there, choosing to write 1.0 as the result there. I need to think about the uncertainty. You'll see in a minute why I chose to write it that way. What is the uncertainty in the stopwatch measurement? Human reaction time, I'm sorry? Times two, yes. That's absolutely correct, huh? So it's human reaction time times two. What's human reaction time? About 0.2. So our reaction time on this is 0 0.4. I'll point out a curiosity. <clears throat> why does a stopwatch even have hundreds of a second on it? It's utterly purpose. Human being is not capable of pressing that button with an uncertainty less than that. So hundreds are meaningless. Isn't that something? Because it makes you, the customer, really good. Yes. And I think you'll find that most people are. So, ah, uh, you see? What's happening? Yeah, it's a society problem. <clears throat> but that will not stop the teenage boys from getting a hold of a stopwatch and just rapidly clicking the button to see how quick they can press it. Uh, and imagine that they are somehow world changing the button, as they might use their calculator to randomly calculate things at high speed. So now that I have my data, the height of the stairwell, and the time it takes to fall the distance to the floor, I can calculate the acceleration due to gravity, but I'll do so appreciating the uh, uncertainty. So here I go, another uncertainty calculation. It's like another example that I get to do. The first step in doing an uncertainty calculation like this is to just do it. So please, for me, would you calculate what the acceleration due to gravity is according to my experimental data? And we would do that simply by taking twice 5.13 and dividing by 1 squared. Here's a little shortcut for you. 1 squared is 1. So really the question is, what is 5.13 squared? I'm sorry, that's not times 2. I did. It's what? 10.26. Now, if we were in unscientific science classes, what we would do now is we would calculate the percent error in our experiment. And we would say, take 10.26 uh, and subtract 9.8 and divide by 9.8. And we would call that good if it was less than 10%. It's a frightfully unscientific thing to do. What I'll do instead now is evaluate the uncertainty in this measurement. The next thing I do is find the relative uncertainties. What is the relative uncertainty of my measurement of the height? 0 0.05 divided by 5.13 times 100. 0 0.974. 0 0.974%. That's pretty great measurement. It's a pretty great measurement. Uh, even though, I mean, we certainly could do better. We devised a, a better strategy for it, but that's, that's pretty good for our experiment today. What is the relative uncertainty in our measurement of the time? 0.4 divided by 1 times 100. 40%! A conspicuously bad measurement! Conspicuously bad! Using a stopwatch to do an experiment like this is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Hannah, 
Well, uh, as soon as we're done with this, I will reveal to you a better version. <laughs> yes, that one is the one I'm referring to. In order to do this calculation, I have to, because I'm, it's time to apply the rule now. Hmm? In order to do this calculation, I have to take the time and square it, which means I'm going to have double the time. So not only is it not good that I made a bad time measurement, but the fact that the time is squared in my physical relationship even makes it worse. 80%. And then I have to add to that 0.974%. So 80, whoops, 0.974%. Here's a little observation. Our measurement of the time is so bad that it swamps the measurement of the height. You might say, make an argument here, like, yes, Ali, we didn't do such a hot job on that height either. It doesn't matter. The uncertainty in the time is so large that the uncertainty in the height is irrelevant. So I'm learning a little bit about doing experimental science. But this is not what I want to know. What I want to know is what is 80.974% of 10.26? 8.3. 8.3. Well, hang on a second. I can't have all these digits. I can't have all these. 5.13 has three significant digits. 1.0 has two significant digits. It has two significant. So my answer can only have two. So I'm going to round it to 10. Well, hang on. I'll get there. I'm going to round it to with two significant digits. It's ambiguous the way I've written it, but we all know what we just did. We rounded it so that it would have two. That zero is significant, not because of some rule written down on paper somewhere. It's significant. We know what we're doing. We know that we forced it to have two. The uncertainty must match precision. This zero is significant. So this number is significant to one's place. So this number must be significant to the one's place. Eight, ten, plus or minus eight. 10 plus or minus a ghastly. It's a little bit strange because this is not usually the result that I get when I do this experiment. The times that you measured were a shade higher than they usually are. Most often when I do this with an honors physics class, I get 10 plus or minus, but no matter. We did the experiment honestly, so this is the result of this experiment. If other researchers were to go and do the same experiment, by that I mean the very next block where we'll do this experiment again, we'll see how that works out and compare results back in 10 plus or minus eight. How do you, why do you say that? Well, my question then becomes, does this experiment verify my hypothesis? Yes. Here's the important part. Open your mind up. Listen to what I'm saying. Based on this, I can go out to a podium somewhere and make a scientific claim that the acceleration due to gravity is... Shadi, how do you know? I did an experiment. I'm a scientist. And as long as I never show you that, I'm telling the truth. Hannah, exactly. Well... <clears throat> you're, you're half right there, Hannah. You're half right. It verifies my hypothesis because is 9.8 meters per second squared in 10 plus or minus 8? Yes. Yes. So, stop. Stop. Yes. Now, if I honestly present you with my data, you, scientist Hannah in the audience at this colloquium on accelerations due to gravity on planets called Earth, would immediately raise your hand and say, well, yes. But your experiment is awful. Better experimentation is required. And I've done the better experiment. I have done an experiment in that stairwell, the very same stairwell where we just did our experiment, and got our official PW value for the acceleration due to gravity. My value that I measured was 9.822 plus or minus 0 0.006 meters per second. That's my experimental result and experiment that I did. But obviously, I must have measured the height of the stairwell very carefully and used a really good timer to do the fall of a thing. No, I didn't even do any of that. Because I knew a thing that Galileo realized way back in the day. Galileo sat in a church one day and was watching oil lamps swing back and forth near the ceiling. And the thing that he realized was that the oil lamps, which were filled with, in principle with different amounts of oil, had the same time period of swing, no matter what their mass was. He realized that the time period of a pendulum is independent of its mass. And in fact, I know a little better than Galileo, that the time period of a simple pendulum is equal to two pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum divided by g. So if I stir this equation around, I can solve it for g, just like I did here. And what I get is, um, um, I can do it, don't you? 4 pi squared divided by t squared times l is equal to g. Now I've got a different experiment that I can do. All I have to do is build a really big pendulum, one that's really long. In fact, I build a pendulum that's three stories tall. It goes from the bottom of the stairwell to the one floor up, and then a floor to the ceiling, and then further up into the skylight. 
And I hang that pendulum down, massively long pendulum. Oh, by the way, before I hang the pendulum up, I measure the length of the pendulum with a centimeter tape. So I measure a really long pendulum to the centimeter. That's a small uncertainty. I measure a big thing with a small instrument to get a very precise result. So then I hang my pendulum and I go all the way down to the floor and I get on the floor with the pendulum. I love a good pendulum. Like when you go to the Franklin Institute, they got that drawings back into Majestic. So I go down and I have a stopwatch. Oh, Shadi, stopwatches suck. The uncertainty in measurement of the stopwatch is 0.4 seconds, you're right. So I pull the pendulum aside a little bit and I let it swing back and forth. And boy, this pendulum, three stories long, goes back and hypnotically. And I wait until it's all the way over here and then bang, I stop the stopwatch and I let it swing. 100. Now the stopwatch is cranking away, cranking away, cranking away, cranking away, cranking away. Click. That number plus or minus 0.4. That's an enormous time measured to the 0.4 of a second. Then I divide it by a hundred. Now I have an extremely precise time measurement. I do the calculation, the uncertainty analysis, and this is the result that I get for G. My result is not only better than the simply dropping the ball down the stairs result, but it's even better than that. I am absolutely certain that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. I am absolutely certain that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. How can I say that? Look at my answer. Look at my experimental result. The uncertainty in my experimental result, tens, hundreds, thousands, in the thousand place. Tens, hundreds, thousands, by the way, matching precision. It's this digit that ticks up by six or down by six. The eight never gets touched. The eight never gets touched. The acceleration due to gravity is nine per second squared. If you want more digits, you're gonna have a two. 9.82. If you want more digits, I'll give you another two, but it's uncertain. If you want more digits than that, then you got to do a better experiment because this is the, it's not the best to do better, but it's what I did. It's what I did. My experiment. So that's the analysis of an actual experiment using uncertainty. And I hope that you can appreciate. It's very deep and difficult to get your head around, but I hope you can appreciate how easy it is to lie, this guy, and manipulate with science. How easy it is in science to not just simply not tell the truth. Right? So we have to be cautious about that. A little bit of reason in the sky.